Hello, bonjour, hello, hi, hey ya, and previet hockey fans. Welcome back to the Euro Puck Podcast, the show where two Brits talk all things European hockey as part of the Hockey Podcast Network. My name is Hayden, or Oddman Rush, as you can see up there, and joining me, of course, once again, is my fellow co-host, Chris Gadsby. Hey, Chris. Hello. How's it going hello. today? Yeah, you doing all right? Yeah, it it sounds as though he's just absolutely started throwing it down outside my window. Oh, well, <laughs> um, I mean, that's a lot different to the fireworks that we were hearing all last week, because obviously here in the UK, for those of you who don't know, uh, we celebrate a thing called Bonfire Night on the 5th of November. Um, but because we're in a lockdown at the moment, people decided to celebrate it every single day of the week, which uh, as somebody... In their that garden. Owned- yeah, exactly, and as somebody that owns a dog, um, made for a bit of a difficult week, I'm not going to lie. Um, but regardless, we're, we're here to talk about hockey, Chris. And, you know, this is episode 12 of the podcast. Today is Monday oh, the know. 9th of November. And happy three months, Chris. We've been doing this podcast for three months. How does that feel? It doesn't feel like that, does it? No, it really but, doesn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, good. We've got... Uh, we've you know had some great guests on and we've got more coming so exactly i mean it, it both feels like we've been doing it for longer and been doing it for less time at the same time which is really interesting I, I can't quite figure out why it feels like that but regardless like chris mentioned we have another guest coming on here today on the show we figured you know we're like i said last week we're trying to get a wide variety of guests on the show and we managed to pick up another one uh, this was very kindly thank you to chris and some of his contacts within the hockey world we managed to get another chris onto the show by the name of chris ellis um, he's very uh, big in the UK hockey scene. Um, some of you who watch uh, on free sports in the UK, watch some of the Elite League games, might recognise Chris Ellis from his rinkside reporting during some of the Elite League games. He works uh, with the BBC. He's done some work with uh, hockey with the BBC. Um, he's also the um, guy in charge of, uh, was it, uh, UK Hockey and Team GB, like like their social media presence. Is, is that right, Chris? You might be able to say it better than I could. Yeah, he's the... I mean, I'll, I'll get him to remind me, but I believe he's the Team GB media. Uh, That's the one. Manager. Yeah. Yes, something like that. Uh, we should probably know this, but, you know, we'll, we'll get him to, to let us know as we uh, interview him. We're just about to interview him in the next sort of five, ten minutes or so. So, yeah, we've got a really good interview lined up for you. He's very knowledgeable about the UK game. Um, he's also done a lot of other international hockey stuff, um, whether it be... Um, kind of watching GB go abroad or some of the other competitions, maybe the Continental Cup and things like that. So we're gonna we're gonna get Chris Ellis here on the show. I'm gonna be outnumbered by Chris's this week, but you know it's gonna be <laughs> it's gonna be good because you know he's he's a great guest to have and he's 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 such a knowledgeable guy with the UK game. So without further ado, here is our interview with Chris Ellis. Now we're very lucky this week. We've only gone and got ourselves Chris Ellis on the Euro Puck podcast who. Many people will know, and he's probably best described as probably one of the hardest working people in, in UK hockey and seems to do absolutely everything. Um, now, Chris, I know we haven't got all evening, so do you want mm-hmm. to, to give us a brief overview of all the bits you're involved with? Because it could easily take a while. It could, so I'll be very brief. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i not doing a lot at the moment, ice hockey-wise, although I am still press officer for Great Britain and Ice Hockey UK, and there's still a lot of things to, to churn out there on the website and social media, even if it's sadly is mostly about cancelled tournaments and, 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 and things like that at the moment, which is, is very sad, and I'm sure we'll come on to things uh, like that. But, you know, when the season was halted, and hopefully when a season gets started again, I'll, you know, like you, Chris, I'll be doing stuff for BBC Radio Nottingham uh, and also ringside for free sports uh, and then you know continuing my work for Great Britain and, and Ice Hockey UK uh, that's the way things like at the moment you know no live hockey to report on uh, but you know whether that's 2021 or, or whenever hopefully that will come back soon. It, so yeah. how did you get into hockey? I'm guessing um, it was growing up near Nottingham in the, in the old barn? Yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, I grew up as a a football fan and a cricket fan in the early days. My mum and dad met on a a bus going to a a Forest away game against Manchester City in the in the 70s. Uh, But as a family, we started to go 
to Panthers in the 90s, maybe mid 90s, but it would be an odd game. And obviously tickets were a lot harder to come by in those days. And if you weren't a season ticket holder, it was harder to get a ticket, not impossible. So we went to the odd game as a family. And in actual, the final season before the, um, the new arena, the final season in the old Nottingham Ice Stadium, I started to go quite regularly with a group of friends and we were able to get tickets, but they were in the very far block next to the away fans. Can't remember what block number it was. And so the seats were actually not looking at the ice. You had to twist your body slightly to see the ice. Okay. But we probably went to the final sort of seven, eight, nine, ten games of that season. Even went to a couple of away games that season. One in Manchester. Just a group of friends got, got quite hooked. I've got to say, that group of friends, none of them really go now. Um, and so as it was, it got to the end of that season and, and um, wanted to get a season ticket in the new stadium. So was looking at the options of getting a new season ticket when Colin Frey, who you'll know well, that the Forest commentator and the sports editor at Radio Nottingham, he also used to cover the Panthers. And he came to me and said, look, I'm going to be a lot busier now covering Forest. Radio Nottingham's going to up their coverage. So I'm not going to be able to go to the ice hockey every week. And, and he said, would, would you like to become that the Panthers reporter and you can imagine how quickly my answer was yes and and that's really how it begun for me for life as a as a reporter you know you know the first season that I kind of wanted to get a season ticket to watch the Panthers uh, after kind of getting that bug so what was that 1999 after going probably handful of games in the 90s maybe I don't know 10 15 games whatever um getting that bug and, and then luckily I got to start reporting on them in the first season in the arena I feel like that's a very common um, start to any UK hockey fans' uh, love of the game is, oh, I was a football fan before, then I managed to find my way into the into arena uh, to watch an ice hockey game for a game or two. And then it's kind of like you mentioned, once you once you see a game or two, and we've mentioned this with pretty much every single one of our guests so far, it's, it's interesting the similarities in the, the kind of origin stories that everybody's had that, you know, once you see a game or two, you get bitten by the bug and you just can't get enough of it at that point, can you? You, you're absolutely right. It, it draws you in. Um, and, and, and I was enchanted by it, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, forget how old I was in 1999, some 20 something. Um, but, but it, it was fantastic. And, you know, you went to this thing and I remember, you know, it, it didn't happen at football that you could sit and have a pint, uh, the dances, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of people got out the, the seats and danced. And it, it was an atmosphere that you hadn't really experienced at football. Um, maybe more so at cricket now with the launch of 2020. Uh, you know, that, that may be a bit, bit similar. But I was enthralled by it and the fast pace of the game, the hitting. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not a fighting man. I, I don't love fights. You know, I, I understand why there's a reason for fighting. You know what? I'm not, I don't, you know, I'm not the type of person that, that wants to see fight after fight. There's a place for fights. And to me, that comes after a bad hit. And, and I like that. Um, but, uh, you know, fights kind of this sort of showboating ones that we may have got five years ago, not such a big a fan of that, but my point was, you know, to, you know, to see the way the crowd reacted to a fight and to a goal, it, it was fascinating. And, and as you guys have touched on, it just draws you in. Yeah. I remember when my, when I was first going and there was a bit of discussion around my family, like, do, they, do you think he'll like it? Because it can be a bit violent. And I think my aunt just went, <laughs> he will love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you must have already been at the BBC then come 99 to have the connection with Colin Frey then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I started out um, making tea at the BBC when I was about 11 or 12. Uh, just really as Colin Frey was arriving at the BBC in those days, Martin Fisher and, and Andrew James, mm. two names that the football fans particularly will probably know well. Um, and, and they were around commentating on Forrest and, and Mark Shardlow as well, who went on to become TV editor in, in Nottingham and has, has recently re retired from the BBC. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I did a bit of work there. Then I went to Radio Stoke, actually, uh, and got some work at, at Radio Stoke, thanks to a, a guy called Mike Hopwood, who used to read the regional news in, in, the, in the East Midlands for a long, long time. And, and he got me some work with him at his production company, which then led to some work at Radio Stoke I then came back to Nottingham uh, worked in Safeway for a short while while I tried to establish a freelance career which is what I felt I wanted to do and um, 
as well, one of my first, you know, one bit I missed out was one of the first things I used to cover for Radio Nottingham was basketball. And that was before I went away to Stoke. Uh, the, the Nottingham Knights at the time, they were in the second tier of, of the basketball's hierarchy. And they had big aims of being in the BBL and it didn't quite happen for them. So I went and watched basketball and reported on basketball, you know, quite a lot for, for Radio Nottingham. And I remember again at the time thinking, I enjoy this ice hockey. I would love to get that chance. And, and as I say, kind of a diversion by Stoke for a couple of years. I got back to Nottingham and, and started a freelance career, which, which began by covering ice hockey for Radio Nottingham. So, so what, was, what was the kind of leading factor into you deciding, you know what, I want to go freelance. I want to, instead of necessarily be completely attached to a certain organisation or a certain publication, I want to, you know, kind of take on the challenge, which is obviously a very exciting but also a very stressful challenge I would imagine of kind of going on your own and kind of it's very much about the work that you put in is the results that you get so so what was your decision yeah. into into uh, deciding to go freelance kind of by default in a way I guess because I went to Radio Stoke and and between sort of working there and for for this production company ran by Mike Hopwood it was just about a full-time job but I got very homesick it was only 50 miles away but I, I really miss my family and friends and, and and really although I enjoyed the people that I worked with in Stoke and I met some friends there that I'm still friends with now I was just very homesick um, so I decided to you know I it got to the point where I thought I, I don't want to be living here anymore. I want to be back in Nottingham. But obviously at the time, there was, there was no really opportunities in Nottingham radio-wise or, or anything else. Um, and so I decided I'd come back and, and see, see where the future lay. And it just so happens that someone I knew got me a job at, at Safeway, at the supermarket. So I kind of started to work there and, and then began to pick up work at Radio Nottingham. Um, because I knew lots of people there because I worked there between 12 and, and 19 as a kid, you know, making tea and then covering the basketball, working on the production side on the Saturday afternoon programme uh, and midweek. So I, I knew the people. So once I was back available, but of course, by working at Safeway, you know, I don't know how many shifts a week it was. I, I wasn't able to always say yes to to the, to the phone call when Radio Nottingham came and said, well, we don't just want you to work this day. Can you work this day? So I, I took that sort of chance. I thought, well, if I ever want to further my career, I've got to be brave here. And I had a lot of ambitions. I, you know, I, I wanted to, to, to work on the radio. You know, I wanted to work in all different forms of media. So I remember having a conversation with my family and said, look, I'm, I'm going to quit this job at, at Safeway. And it's not going to be easy because sometimes, and I remember in the very early days, I might get one shift a week you know, one and a half shifts a week, maybe two at the max. And it was a tough decision at the time to make because it was some security working at, at Safeway, even though my passion was radio. I love working at Safeway, M met some great people, but my passion was, was radio from the very start. So, was, you know, that, that's how it came about. You know, after coming back to Nottingham, doors started to open and, 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 and there it was. You know, I, I started to, to get those to get those opportunities and 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 as I say that the conversations went went my way and, and that's how the freelance career began. So how did you you must have dreamt maybe not even in your wildest dreams that you'd be like managing all the Great Britain ice hockey stuff and, and being on free sports and and going round around the world and, and and things like that. How did you kind of I suppose you, you just went in with trying to build your reputation up. How did you then make the step from so just doing the local reporting to then being free sports and, well, obviously before free sports and then the GB role? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's amazing. And I still have to pinch myself and, 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 and you know, to think that I get to, to talk about ice hockey on, on radio and, and television and, and also, you know, for Great Britain, I mean, there's two separate stories, really. And I'll start with, with Great Britain. Um, basically, I, I started to do a bit of work for the Elite League, which I no longer do. But, but you know, the, the Elite League work kind of set, set me on the path there. And uh, it, was, it was Eamon Convey and Andy French, who, who both work for the Elite League and, and Ice Hockey UK. Andy French, a great friend of mine now, who still works as Ice Hockey UK as, as the uh, general secretary. And, and I remember saying to them both, 
you know, the, Dave Sims did great coverage of Great Britain men mm. uh, in the early days, alongside Jeff Foster as well, who worked for BBC Radio Coventry and Warwickshire. And the two of them commentated on games and, and Simsy was, was fantastic. Um, but there was a lack of coverage for the women and the juniors. And so I said to, to, to Andy French and to Eamon Convery and to David, I don't want to step on your toes. You know, you, you, know, you do what you've got to do. But we need to, as a federation, I think that, you know, we should promote these women and these juniors much more and they agreed so so that's where that kind of began with with that I, you know simsy did his thing with great britain and um and i did the stuff with the women and and uh, and the juniors and then when paul thompson left the great britain setup david decided his time had come for whatever reason and i'm quite sad about that because you know i think you know dave sims in the great britain setup would be a, a massive asset yes he can be controversial but he's so passionate about great britain uh, and and we kind of work closely in the gb setup in the sense that um he does you know we send him stuff about the sheffield steelers but the only time i really got to work with him on a national stage was was one of my first tournaments in fact i think it was the first tournament was when we went to latvia in the final olympic qualifiers many years ago where if gb had won that they would have made the olympics they lost their, their three games um but but simply commentated on um espn i think with with aaron murphy which was the start of his not his career, but it is kind of like a tie-in with Great Britain and UK ice hockey. That was the first time I really came across Aaron. So those two commentated on, on, on the ESPN, I think, as it was then. So my point there is that I'm sad that, that I've never really got a chance to work closely with Simsy with a GB hat on apart from that. But when Simsy decided to stand down because his, his good mate Tomo was, was, was leaving the programme, again the door opened there and there's a vacancy for someone to go away with the men as well and naturally with me doing the junior stuff that turned around for me to work with that so so that was uh, you know a, 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 again in a question Chris would you like to work with GB men as well and, and and yes absolutely I would and then in terms of the television stuff I spent a bit of time away from Radio Nottingham in terms of covering ice hockey uh, the manager at the time you know th this was where my elite league journey started with the uh, elite league as press officer the manager of Radio Nottingham at the time said you know I don't feel you can work for Radio Nottingham and be the elite league press officer and have a impartial mm. you know the BBC is very impartial and while it was frustrating I did understand where he was going so he said I, I, you know you've got to choose and then I just thought about my GB journey and where I wanted to go and I got these ambitions and I said look I love doing what I do for Radio Nottingham and boy did I love commentating I got to commentate you know on some brilliant cup final wins for the Nottingham Panthers I got to to make some amazing friends from from the people that I met uh, from the Panthers teams in those years uh, and so it was tough to give up that gig at Radio Nottingham at the time um, but I wanted to to see where I could go with the Elite League uh, and this door was opening maybe for television uh, and, and and I had a conversation um, with a great guy called James Mitchell, who was the producer of the, the telly video show produced for Sky Sports at the time. Of course, it's now Free Sports. It was Sky Sports. Uh, and again, a bit of an introduction from, from Simsy. Uh, and it was like, we need a ringside reporter. Well, I'm available now. I don't work for the BBC. Uh, and that's how that journey began. So, you know, it was about putting yourself in the shop window. Unfortunately for me that, you know, the cards fell in my favor. They, they, you know, I'm very lucky. They could have fallen in a different way and somebody else might've, might've got the nod, but I'm very lucky that it was me. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, your work with Free Sports and uh, your work with Aaron Murphy and Paul Lady and the Free Sports uh, crew. Cause I, I think that's probably the, the, way that most uk hockey fans will recognize you is you standing ringside giving reports to uh murphy and ad about you know any news on player injuries or or updates from coaches uh between periods and everything um I, i'm glad that you mentioned murphy specifically because uh, chris and i have contacted uh, uh murphy and we're hoping to get him on the show at some point and, and we really wanted to ask you if you had any uh interesting or really funny stories regarding uh, aaron murphy that we could kind of ask him his side of the story once he comes on uh you you put me on the spot here i mean i'm very lucky <laughs> to have worked with some you know in my sky sports days i worked with simsy and with with rick strachan anna woolhouse you know just to name but 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 three people paul thompson um i mean you know there was a great crew led by a great crew there led by james mitchell 
Um, and, and now again, you know, absolutely. The, the, the team and Televideo, the production company there, now produce the, the stuff for free sports. And I can't speak highly of the whole team at, at Televideo now that we work with, that, that myself and Aaron Murphy and Paul Lady, you know, have, have a chance to, to, to work with. The off-ice team that, that make it happen. I mean, you know, Paul and Aaron, let's face it, they're the main guys. I have a bit part with, with the stuff I do some ringside in the interviews. But, but you know, the, the off-ice team make it you know behind the scenes they make it so great for the for the three of us and it's a joy you know it's a pleasure to to go on these trips i'm missing their company so badly you know paul paul and, and aaron um you know i mean i'm I, I suppose one of the things that you could ask aaron is does paul lady ever buy a round of drinks that'd be a good <laughs> question uh i see what he says to that um, I'm just trying to think i mean i mean aaron's a very professional guy you you know his his attention to detail is is amazing, um, you know. I mean, and, you know, we have a great laugh when we go to to games on the road. I'm trying to think of specific instances, and, and off the top of my head, can't think of any. But you know, as we chat, I'll try and think of any. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, normally Paul and I travel together, whether we have to fly somewhere um, because it's Scotland or, or Northern Ireland, or whether Paul makes me drive because, you know, one time in a hundred, Paul seems to drive uh, and we'll normally be waiting <laughs> for Murph because, you know, it always seems the flight from East Midlands are uh, much earlier in the day when, than where, when Paul can, uh, than when Aaron can get from Dublin. So normally Paul and I are waiting for him wherever. Um, and, and then the three of us just, you know, it's, it's, it's great for the three of us to, to get together. And as I say, I'm, I'm missing that a lot right now. I think it's great you mentioned the off-ice team to put the broadcast together because I didn't realise being obviously doing the, the live streams for the lines, which is very much just kind of me and Jono standing there and it's one microphone cable that plugs into the, into the computer on the wall. When I went, I think it must have been the New Year's Eve game against Sheffield where I was doing, I was dialed into Radio Nottingham on ISDN just the amount of cables and boxes of equipment and people scurrying around two hours before the game to get everything ready. It's, it's quite an operation. I think a lot of the, the off-screen people don't get the, the credit they deserve a lot of the time. No, absolutely. And, and it's not just the producers and the directors who probably are the, are the main people. And they're the ones that obviously the decisions they make Will, will decide whether the show's any good or not. But but also the the, the camera operators, uh, the, the the tech is behind the scenes, you know. And 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 Televideo do a great job. It's a it's a small team. It's way it's a way smaller team now than the team that I work with with Sky Sports with Televideo the first time around. I, I bet half as many people now work on the mm. free sports show that that used to work on the Sky Sports show. But that's all down to budgets. You know, there there isn't an endless budget. You know, the elite league aren't making any money out of it uh tele video aren't making like thousands thousands of pounds to produce a show and free sports as well they are not making thousands and thousands of pounds you know in broadcasting rights it doesn't ha happen in in uk ice hockey i mean one of the reasons that that free sports you know if it wasn't for their passion and their determination led by aaron and other people at, at free sports you know free sports you know don't see this as a money-making exercise, nor do they leave, nor do Televideo, and nor do the people that w work on the show. It's their passion to show ice hockey mm -hmm. that gets this off the ground. And, and it really is, you know, when you think about the millions of pounds that changes hands in football and other sports, it, it really is a joy to, to be part of. And I, I think it's that passion that helps get the product to, uh, whether it be football fans or cricket fans or rugby fans, that might not have necessarily seen a game of ice hockey before, let alone been anywhere near an arena, if there is one near where they live. And, and the fact that there are these passionate people that, like you mentioned, say, yeah, we might not make the most amount of money from this, but we really do care about the sport and we want to see it grow in Great Britain and, and see it become a bigger sport on the, uh, and, and kind of get the coverage it deserves. That's what makes all the difference compared to you know, the millions of pounds that go into the, uh, the Premier League every year. I mean, they've already got a massive audience. It's kind of uh, the Elite League and you know, the, the NIHL and all of those other leagues. That they're, it, the the on-ice product has never been a problem. It's just kind of getting it to the people that we know would love to see it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's about picking up new fans and, and laps old fans as well. I mean, you know, I read a comment on, on social media or maybe a forum that I visited 
online and, and you know the, the, you know people talking about the shows that go out there's criticism you have to expect that and that's fair enough you know in the jobs that you do whether you you know whether you play the sport or report on the sport you have to have broad shoulders because not everyone's going to like you you know that that's a fact of life but saw a few comments from from people you know who said we watched the show you know we used to go and watch in the super league days we haven't watched ice hockey since there was two in particular you know you know from similar people on similar lines and they said you know we've watched this game and and we're hooked again you know we, we want to go and watch and, and that's you know that's what you want to do Murph and uh, Paul Lady and I want to bring across that passion and that and that drama uh, and that's that's great so you know and I know there's a real awkward balance between elite league clubs now you know because they it's a bombs on seats business and it's going to be even more whenever we return hopefully 21 22 but it but it is it, it's a bombs on seats business and there's some owners in the elite league who are and, and you know neil black's made no secret of the fact that his clubs are bombs on seats business he doesn't do a webcast um i think he probably gets the benefit of a of a television deal but he's probably not a massive advocate in terms of others who realize that you know or who feel that if you are on television you're reaching x amount of people and you can't quantify how many people might say oh well i'm not going to go to the game today because it's on telly you might get 30 people say i'm not going to the game today it's on telly but you know over time you might get 20 30 40 fans who see the product and want to come back or or you know someone might say to their friend or my team you know sheffield steelers or on TV tonight, it's on Free Sports, you can get that, it's on channel, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever, I should know, but I, I can't remember, it's been that long. <laughs> it's um, changing. Yeah, what do, you, what do you know, it does, and on different platforms, you know, and, 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 you know, fans can say to their friends, you know, watch it on TV, you know, you might see me or whatever. So, you know, I, I understand there's a, a, a conversation about bombs on seats, but I don't agree with it, you know, I, mm. I, that's, a, that's fair enough, but from my point of view, I've worked inside the EHL. I now don't work inside the EHL, but I work for, for people covering the EHL. And I, I think the exposure of their sport is massively important, but the EHL just has a, a fine line to tread because it does need bombs on seats for it to survive. Yeah, I think that's one, obviously with the, with the webcast I do for the lines as well, I think it, it's almost more for the away fans that can't travel there's not a huge amount of Belfast Giants fans that can fly to Nottingham on a Sunday afternoon and then get away from Nottingham back to East Midlands Airport and then from East Midlands Airport back to, to, to Belfast as well. But just to, just to round off kind of the section on your career, Chris, obviously you're uh, a long way into it and I kind of just, just starting out on slightly different paths. Very end of you, particularly um, last uh, earlier on this year going off to the Continental Cup final, what advice have you got for people kind of in our position wanting to get to your position and, and do what you do? Well, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, and it, it is really just never give up. I mean, you, you'll have down times uh, and you'll have things that, that don't go your way. Look, I remember right at the start of my broadcasting career, I, I was sent by Radio Stoke to do an interview with Frank Bruno. It, it was one of the first interviews I'd probably ever done. It was dreadful. I have a copy of it somewhere, but, but <laughs> thankfully it's lost. And I had um, a couple of programs. Like I think I was sent for the drive time program, but the religious program wanted to, um, to, to get a few questions from him because he's a religious man. And the thing was, it was at the opening of a gym or a leisure center or something like that. And, and basically I followed him around. His PR company was like, you know, do it when, when you can do it when we say so. I followed him around and, and, and I've got, you know, an image now that it was in the hall and they said, right, now do it. So there must have been dozens of people around, VIP people at the opening of this gym or leisure center or something in Stoke. And it was horrendous. I asked him about four <laughs> terrible questions. I mean, I remember the question about his faith. I, 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 you know, I was kind of nervous about asking him that question. So my question was, can I ask you a question about your faith? And he went, uh, yeah, what? And then I was like, well, I believe you're a Christian. You know, and, and it was just nonsense. You know, I should have asked him like, you know, how he used sport to, to you know, how he used his faith to, to, to progress in sport. If I did that interview again, it would hopefully be better. Um, you know, but, but my point is, is, you know, as, as someone trying to, to get into the sport, it, 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 you know, and get into covering sport, you will get knockbacks, but, you know, be, be confident in your own ability. 
Um, and, you know, and, and never, you know, it, there's lots of no's. I had no's at, at different times in my career and, and that can be tough to take. But, you know, if, if you're passionate enough and, and you keep trying, you know, the, the doors will open. I mean, Chris, you've been knocking on the door at, at Radio Nottingham, you know, for a while. Like, you know, I, I know that. From, yeah. you, know, <laughs> Every and, year. And then, you know, exactly. And then and then suddenly a door opens, you know, and and, you know, I would say grasp that opportunity. You know, don't. And, and you know, this is not aimed at you. Don't be lazy because you're not, you know, and I know you're not. I mean, you know, your stats put mine to shame, Chris. I mean, you know, when we started talking, when we met in the, the pub, didn't we, you know, for the, for the first season, we were going to cover them together and we agreed which games we would cover. You know, your, your, your database and the things you were telling oh, me. On my Excel like, spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but... He but, loves but an be, Excel you, spreadsheet, Chris <laughs> does. <laughs> but, but, but that was fantastic, Chris. You know, be, you know, be dedicated, be thorough. Um, and, and, you know, things I think will, will come your way. Uh, and that, that's advice to, to anyone starting out. I you know I've seen quite a few people. You know, John O'Bullard is, a, is another person mm. who had been knocking on the door and, and getting the odd gig here and there. He started his own fanzine. He started his own podcast and he took the plunge and he's doing really well for himself. You know, he, he's got to cover Great Britain for free sports. He's now covering all sorts of different sports. And, that you know, I tip my hat to him because, you know, he took that plunge. He, he's always wanted that. He did have the safety net of a full time job, but he thought, no, that's not what I want in life. I'm, I'm going to go down and, and take the chance. And, and Jono, again, he's good at his job. He's dedicated. He's friendly, you know, and again, ne- you know, be humble, never be arrogant, you know, because, you know, you, you don't want to get into a sport and people think, well, he's an idiot. He's a pillar. You know, I'm not going to talk to him. Um, just, just, just be humble. And, 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 and I think, you know, that that's my advice and things will, will come your way. So we've talked a lot about, the way you got into the career, your freelance career and how you've managed to get some of the gigs that you have. I want to kind of pivot slightly now towards talking more about the UK game. We've obviously alluded to it slightly already, but talking about the season or the lack thereof that we've got this year. um, What are your thoughts on the EIHL's decision to suspend the season? Uh, Of course, it's it's, uh, been said that it's suspended at the moment, but I think it's fair to say that from a fan perspective and certainly from Chris and my perspective, it's looking a lot more likely that there might not be a season this year. And I think quite rightly so, given all of the different uh, factors that go into it. But um, considering you're a little bit more uh, involved with uh, the kind of behind the scenes stuff compared to what Chris and I are, what are your thoughts on on the Elite League season uh, suspending, uh, coming back to the drawing board next year? And, and do you think they've made the right decision? Do you think uh, you would have potentially maybe made some different choices? Like, what are your thoughts on the whole thing? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, th- they made the only decision that they could make. And, and let's be clear, they 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 didn't say they'd cancelled, yeah. although it felt like they had. That there's yeah. still a chance. Now... I mean, subsequent things that have happened might have made this decision that I'm about to say, well, I would have gone and it probably would have been a poor decision. And maybe that's why I just look on from the outside and report and, <laughs> and, and I'm a press officer and I'm not an owner or a GM. Uh, but I would like to have seen, um, and, and the fact that it feels like it won't happen now might sound a, ba- a bad thing, but, but I feel, and I might be totally wrong and someone from the Elite League could correct me, but I feel the Elite League want to put a close enough product on the ice to what they've been doing so for the past few years, which is absolutely fine. That product is great. Mm. Um, and, you know, and, that, and that product has seen teams compete in the Champions League, which is remarkable, which saw Cardiff and Sheffield and, and, and teams like that win games. Nottingham get to the knockout stages, where I was very lucky to go and commentate on a game for Radio Nottingham on Panthers in Zurich in the knockout stages of the Champions League. Um, so their product has worked. It, it's it's right up there. The Elite League, when we finished, was one of the best, you know, the best quality it ever been. But I was thinking and talking to friends and, and colleagues, and and I would like to have seen the Elite League maybe think to themselves, right, you know, maybe we just have sixth imports and play lots of British kids. Now I am gonna mm. be an advocate of the British game, I, you know. I understand why the Elite League has 14 imports. I want to see that reduced. 
as, as soon as we can. Would it happen? It might now happen because of coronavirus. I think it's uh, Gareth Chumlers I saw an interview with in the newspaper, maybe done by Craig Anderson in the past couple of days, I think. And, and that suggests that they will reassess their product, but there was no firm sort of indication. But my point was at the, at the start of lockdown and the decision about next season, I did ponder whether they could perhaps do social distancing, maybe get, you know, 50% in, 25% in. And maybe, you know, maybe elite league clubs will look at the NIHL and this streaming series, which is a very interesting thing. And maybe my idea that I'm mm. about to finally come on to will work as a streaming situation. But, you know, have four or five imports, but then have British players. Whether you can entice the British players back that are already abroad, I don't know. But there's, there's hundreds of, of, of British players in the game. Yes, they're not up to the elite league standard that we used to at the moment. But that doesn't mean that they couldn't play in a, in a four or five import league that would at least see some hockey to see us through to the 21-22 season. Now, the Elite League might feel that's not the way they want to brand their product, and that's fine. Um, but I would like to see that happen. And originally, I wanted to see that happen behind closed doors with social distancing. But with the government not allowing fans back in the stadium yet, uh, I saw even today there was a, a, a thing went round saying that there's no time scale. I think it was something in mm. Parliament, still no time scale. But whether we can get fans back in social distance or, you know, if this NIHL thing works and the elite need like the look of it, let's have some sort of shortened season with less imports and let's give these British kids a chance to, to play some hockey at the top flight. That's the way I would go. I think a lot of it... Um... So I know Neil Black, he was speaking to you, Chris, for Radio Nottingham, said that they needed the arena to be kind of two-thirds full to break even on, on a game. Yes, what break even on 14 imports, that, though, yes. That, yeah, break even on 14 imports. If you took eight of them out and played, you know, young British guys who will quite happily almost do it for nothing, yeah, then that, make, that makes a, a big difference. I know we spoke to Matt Bradbury two weeks ago. He's obviously been... Uh, spent most of his career with with youngsters and, and young Brits in the GB University squad. And there is definitely talent there. Um, I was surprised when I saw a poll, I can't remember where, and if something like 20% of people said they wouldn't go and watch their elite league team if it was full of young British players, which really surprised me. I mean, it, that surprises and disappoints me, but, you know, I respect everyone's opinion. Some people, you know, and I see this around social media and stuff, some people want to see quality and, and, and that's fine. But, you know, I, these British players need to get a chance to play. Uh, and, and Matt Bradbury, I mean, you know, I'm glad you mentioned him. What, what a great person he's been for the development of, of players in Nottingham. I mean, look at the players that have come through his tenure. M maybe most recently, Robert Lakovich and, and Ollie Betteridge. But there's been, there's been dozens and, and dozens of them. Um, and, and he is a massive advocate of bringing the British players through. And, and that's happened from the Nottingham Junior Club and, and, of course, you know, the Nottingham Lions as well. I mean... I would like nothing more to see some of those young Nottingham Lions kids given a chance this year. Look, it may not happen. We probably won't get fans back in in February, March. But, but maybe the NHL streaming series will work and, you know, the NHL clubs might go, well, we made a couple of quid here. Um, because, mm. you know, let's not forget, it's, it's not all about making money. I don't know what's happening at every elite league club, but, you know, the, the players not playing, that's one thing. But the off-eye staff as well. You know, there's office staff who I assume are still furloughed. Um, furlough was going to come to an end, now it's not. So have some people had to leave their clubs across the 10 clubs? You know, and, and rightly so. The players have, you know, that I'm concerned about the play. Pete Russell said in an interview that I did with him that went out on, on Ice Hockey UK media a, a couple of days ago, um, that he's concerned about the players. That's his number one priority. He wants them to have jobs for their family. But you also have the, the thing of the behind the scenes people involved in ice hockey in many ways, not least the, the, um, the players and, you know, not least the, the, the players and the off-ice staff. And Neil Black did say something very interesting. I can't remember whether this was on air or, or off air, but I'm sure he won't remind me, mind me saying if it was off air. You know, he said one of the reasons he wants to get started again, and this might, you know, debunk the myth a bit about Neil Black 
who, who what's the word that people use fleece fleecing the fans which has been said many times by nottingham fans you know black said i want to get started again because of, of mm. all the people behind the scenes not just with my club nottingham panthers but the arena a lot of great people at the nottingham arena lost yeah. their jobs you know because of the pandemic so some some brilliant people who i won't name you know because it may not be fair on them but they'll know who they are and they were super talented people at all levels of that organization and it was such a i'm sure it was a tough decision for 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 the bosses at the, at the arena to to do that but i'm sure they had you know no other choice it's such a tough time to be a, a boss of a big company like that or a chief exec but my point was was neil black said to me I want to get hockey started for, for people like that. You know, people are out of work doing this sport that we love. And he says that doesn't feel right. So, um, so yeah, so, so maybe there's a way to, to get back, whether behind closed doors in a streaming series. I, I think that, you know, there, there'll be all eyes on that NIHL one in the next few weeks. I, I think especially given the fact that we've been so starved of hockey here in this country over the last weeks and months, I think, I think interest in it will be at an all-time high and that could really benefit the NIHL as well. And I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the behind-the-scenes staff as well because I think as hockey fans, like like me, myself, I'm not necessarily uh, involved uh, freelance media or like with a specific media company. I'm more of a fan compared to, to maybe you two. Um, but it's very easy when you see the news like, oh, the Elite League has been suspended or they've suspended their season until a further date. You immediately think of your team and the players on your team and I think quite rightly so, Chris, you need to also take into account all of the equipment staff on that team, the coaching staff on that team, uh, the people that operate the arenas, the people that do the, the tickets for the arenas and all of the behind the scenes people. It has such a domino effect for everybody involved in the sport. And yes, uh, sport is used as uh, as escapism for a lot of people and kind of especially now more than ever, people have wanted sports to kind of forget about the, the craziness that is the year 2020. But mm. there is a lot of people that is having a, a direct impact on the fact that there isn't any play. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you put it there in a, in a nutshell. And, you know, and, and not just, you know, we, we've just touched on the people behind the scenes, whether it be at arenas, whether it be at clubs, equipment managers, just day-to-day -day office staff. You know, I, I'm sure that, you know, some of them have been kept on. I mean, I don't really know across the leagues, you know, the, 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 you know people may well have lost their job at, at you know, at, at hockey clubs. They've certainly lost their jobs, you know, at the Motor Point Arena. Um, but also fans, like you say, it's an escapism. You know, I know a lot of, a lot of people close to me who are pretty glum like now that they're, they're missing their, their weekly hockey fix. I mean, you know, like, you know, 99% of people hockey, you know, it's, it's a hockey family and, and that's right. You know, um, you know, more than any other sport, you, you get that feeling that it's a real great community. And that community can't come together right now. And that's, that's, that's really sad for players, coaches, off ice staff, behind the scenes and, and fans alike. I think, yeah, I mean, we've both mentioned on this podcast before, like how the lack of sport has, has affected our kind of mental well-being. And as I was saying, how you know, we'll work Monday to Friday during the week and then the sport at the weekends, because the BBC stuff, quite frankly, didn't feel like work in the slightest. Mm -hmm. You got to go and watch ice hockey. Yeah, was, was your escape and the and the joy of it, and we haven't got that. But kind of moving past the, the the pandemic, how do you feel? You've had what two decades now of reporting on ice hockey. How do you think the the sport in the UK has has grown and developed? And where do you think, obviously, post all of this, you'd like to see it develop into the future? What can it grow into? What a great question. I mean, you know, when I got started covering the sport, it was the Super League. And I think all the clubs will admit that, you know, they went too far. I mean, teams were spending millions of pounds a year on wages. Manchester Storm, allegedly. Sheffield Sealers. I mean, I always tell, tease Paul Lady about that one because, of course, David Sims teases myself because... Sheffield won, uh, Paul Lady won the league with Sheffield Steelers. I mean, that team that, that won the, the league in that Super League era uh, was ridiculous that Paul Lady played on. Um, but yeah, so, so Dave Sims always teases me and then I always tease Paul and say, but it wasn't really a win because uh, I remember the Super League said that you'd broken the, the wage cap that year and effectively the trophies were null and void. But you're not going to take that away from those players because that set of players is probably still one of the best teams 
that I've ever seen in the Elite League. Uh, sorry, in the in the UK because it was Super League then. But yeah, going back to your your original point, uh, I mean that you know has you know the Elite League might not have the consistently sort of caliber of player from that Super League days. But it's very, very good now. And it, mm. the sport's very different to, to 20 years ago. I mean, I remember when the Elite League started. Why did it start? It started because we lost two clubs about three months into a season. Um, and we had five teams left, five teams in the top flight of, of UK ice hockey. And that's what the demise was of the, the Super League. And then the Elite League was born. And, and the Elite League, you know, one thing that disappoints me and, you know, the Elite League started by saying, you know, we do want to develop British players. And in the early days, a lot of British players came through the system. David Clark, you know, came to Nottingham in the first season and look where he ended up. People like Jonathan Phillips and, and people like um, Jason Hewitt and, and Mark Thomas, in, in those early days you know, got their chances in the Elite League. And then look at Nottingham, Mark Levers, Paul Moran, and, you know, just to mm. name a, a couple more. Uh, there was another wave of players that, that came through from a Nottingham point of view. You know, you look at Steve Lee and you look at Robert Farmer. From a Sheffield point of view, you look at Robert Dowd and, and Ben O'Connor. Um, and just going back to the point, I, I do think the... It's not just the Elite League here. I just feel... That lots of people say, well, it's your job to, to develop the GB players. And, and no one, you know, really takes it by the scruff of the neck. And I know a lot of people tried to get this sort of under-20s league going a, a few years ago that would have been an, an elite under-20s. And I've heard David Sims talk a lot about that on podcasts. And, and, and I wish the elite league clubs at the time when that was potentially going to happen had taken it by the scruff of the neck. And I know it wouldn't have been a moneymaker. But I wish there'd been some sort of elite league, you know, whether it was run by the Elite League or Ice Stock UK or, or whatever. But I wish there would have been that the clubs at the top said, right, we're going to develop our players. We're going to have an under-20s league and it can be a feeder league to play in, in the Elite League. Um, and, and, and that's just not happened. And, and I just feel we're not seeing enough players develop British players in elite league clubs. And I don't blame the coaches because Tim Wallace, his job is to win games. If he doesn't win mm. games, he gets the sack, yeah. you know, and that, I'm just picking Tim Wallace, you know, as a Nottingham point of view, you know, coaches across the, you know, the same goes in Sheffield and, and other areas. So in many ways, I don't blame Tim Wallace for not trying to develop players. Corey Nielsen, did it and did it really well. He managed to get the knack of combining the two uh, and you've got to hold your head off in Nottingham to him. Paul Thompson to an extent as well, wherever he's gone. Um, but it's a hard thing for coaches to do. So I don't really get too angry when I see, you know, I, don't, I see a coach who's not playing British players, especially at the, the so-called bigger clubs. You know, it's nearer the top. It's nearer the top of the chain. Um, and I would love the, the owners of the elite league to get together and say, right, we're going to have this under 20s league. We're going to invest X amount of pounds in that. You know, maybe it won't happen now because of the pandemic, because Finances are going to be tight. I bet Top Coleman would get on the phone to me and say, you know, you do realise X, Y and Z finances, you know, from, yeah. you know, or Tony Smith or whatever. I get that. Um, but we, we, we need to find a way to develop our British players even better. I mean, you know, you'd think from the way I was set talking that, that things are bleak. They're not. We're in the top flight of, of World Championship ice hockey. <laughs> That's remarkable. But it's, it's the future that worries me. And that's not because of the talent. There's some immense talent in the programme. But this immense talent of 15, 16, 17, 18 now needs to be coached in the right way and now needs to get the best possible chance to play at the top level. And that's how I'd like to see the league develop. And will coronavirus maybe make that happen? Because budgets will be smaller and so import levels will have to go down? I don't know. Um, but, but, you know... UK ice hockey is at a very interesting crossroads. It always was, but with the pandemic, I think it's, it's made it even more uncertain. But I think it has a chance to, to come out of this and build something very special. Um, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I couldn't that's... agree more. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I think that's a lot of, with, as you said, because Nottingham and, and Sheffield and co, they're considered big clubs in, in the elite league stand. It's a bit like you're, 
are kind of the fans and stuff. It's a bit like your kind of Barcelona's Real Madrid. They expect success year after yeah. year after year. Yeah. You can't have four or five years of a rebuilding process like you can in an NHL team and say, right, we've had our cups times. Now we're going to, you know, start with youngsters and build them back up again. You can't have that. The pressure is on, you know, Guy Doucette, Tim Wallace and all the way through the league with, with Cardiff, with Shefford, with Belfast to be up at the top every year, to, to try and get trophies every single year. They can't afford to have those years where they just play youngsters and develop the youngsters. Yeah, absolutely. Were you going to make a point on that line as well, Hayden? Yeah, it was just kind of um, going along the lines of what you mentioned. It's more of a league and an organ- organisational philosophy that needs to change as opposed to the coaching staff that's in charge. Because at the end of the day, the coach, he can only do what he can with the players that have been presented to him. If he's presented more or less imports and more sort of local younger prospects, then of course he's going to play them more often. But like you mentioned, uh, Chris, it's at the end of the day, these coaches, they're, they're being paid to win games. The fans aren't going to be happy with mm. them if they don't win games. I, I, I think many sort of more of the casual elite league fans as well, they would much prefer their team play the import players 20 minutes a night than play their fourth line of, you know, 18 year old uh, UK prospects. Cause if it means they get the win, they get the win. It's it's just it's just it's such a difficult balance because I completely agree with like your idea of doing a junior league and kind of kind of like our equivalent to the Ontario Hockey League or the Quebec League mm. they have over there where it's kind of sixteen or eighteen to twenty year olds um, playing against similar age groups, similar talent levels. So then you can really kind of pick out those great players. You can pick out the ones that are that look like they can move on and have a really successful career and make the jump to the EIHL. But you can also understand, given the fact that at the end of the day, these teams are businesses and their kind of main goal is to make money and be profitable. You can understand why there might be some reservations from that. And given the fact that uh, the sport of hockey over here isn't the biggest thing. So it's kind of the the potential uh, profits they might make are, are noticeably smaller compared to some other sports. There's just so many different factors that go into all of these decisions. And while it's easy to kind of sit here and be like, ah, oh, like that would be so good. Obviously, the people making the decisions for the most part are making the right decisions for them and their businesses at the end of the day, aren't they? You're absolutely right. But, it, you know, it's sad that, you know, a lot of our young talent, not all our young talent, but a lot of our young talent have to go abroad now. Yeah. You know, 15, 16, 17. You, you look at the players that have started to to go to North America to get a schooling and to, to play hockey. And, and look, that's brilliant. And, and they're going to develop into to great players by doing that. And, and that's that's fantastic. But you've got to have parents who can afford that. You know, and, and, and I don't want this sport to be, you know, ice hockey is expensive to play as it is but you know should you know should if you've got rich parents determine whether you can you know you know you're either gonna have to have rich parents or you're gonna have parents who are gonna have to take out a big bank loan or, or a remortgage a house you know i you know i see loads of boys and girls you know not just guys you know guys and girls go abroad to to further their career i mean and it's even harder for the girls um, I mean, there's some real talented youngsters uh, in the GB program, in the women's program, and they too have to, to go abroad. And, and it's sad that that has to happen. And I just wish there was a way. And, and you know, I've got my own ideas. If, if I was in charge, not that I don't think that would ever happen, but if I was in charge, I'd like to set processes out that could could see players stay in that under 20s league would be one thing I'd like to see, you know, GB, I mean, GB women, I mean, you know, on a slightly different, you know, going off a different tangent, but, but, you know, thanks to, to Jeff and Jeff Hemmerman and Jackie Pye, who, who, who at the time were heavily involved in the EIHA, you know, they got GB women playing against under 20 teams from the EIHL. And that was great for them. Um, but I, and, I, and I, you know, for the women's program, I want to see more of that because the women need to test themselves because, you know, because obviously the, the sort of difference in, in the top level of the women's game here, you know, there's, there's a real disparity in, in talent, you know. But again, that's because, the, you know, we, we need to be able to get these people more chances to be coached and, and more chances to, to play games. So, again, you know, with the women and, and with the, the juniors, I just wish there was a way, you know, and if I put the sort of elite league hat back on, there just needs to be a way that we can develop these players and, and not see them move abroad, even though that's great for their careers, because, you know, we want to see them playing in the elite league and, and, and develop into great talents. 
Yeah, there's uh, definitely, I think, a lot in in the way of development that uh, that can be done in the elite league. So, Chris, you've seen probably countless number of games in the domestically all around the league you've as you said you've gone Europe you've seen GB games what's the, the greatest game you've ever seen oh. live <laughs> oh that's a bugger um <laughs> well oh you told me to ask harder questions <laughs> <laughs> Tim Wallace, so I've taken that <laughs> I mean I mean I mean I could I could run through I could run through loads and there'll be loads of great games that I've forgotten. In the early days, one that, that stood in my mind, and, and for the wrong reasons really, covering Nottingham, but Nottingham were fighting a lot to the Sheffield Steelers with a period to go. Uh, they tied 5-5. Ron Shudra scored with almost the last touch of the game. It's a crazy game. John Craig had got a hat trick and Nottingham were roaring uh, and Sheffield came back. And that one was 5-5. Again, a Super League game. I think that was Elite League. It was, yeah, because John Craig had. I think a Super League game. Nottingham were 5-1 down to the London Knights. And they came back, or maybe 6-1 down. They came back to tie 6-6, but lost 7-6 in overtime, maybe. You know, that one might have been clouded. That was a fabulous game. Uh, again, domestically, you know, I, you know, one of the biggest games that I look back on fondly I don't think I can ever beat because it's my first big game to commentate on for Radio Nottingham was Challenge Cup final when Kim Aru scored in overtime for the Nottingham Panthers in Sheffield I've been used to covering Panthers in the first three or four years big game Sheffield win it that was just what happened and that was the first yeah. time Nottingham had beaten Sheffield in a cup final so, so that was fabulous so I mean there's so many games that I could talk about um but obviously, you know, you go to the you go to the GB games. I've been asked this a couple of times on various interviews and stuff. The two games that no, I'm I'm going to give you three games that stand out. One was the you know many people would have forgotten this game. One was the start of the Pete Russell era, and it was his first World Championship GB in the third tier of uh, of ice hockey in the World Championship, playing Croatia. Bear in mind, the year before, they'd lost 4-0 to Croatia. That's how low GB had slumped, although G, uh, Croatia did have a load of dual nationals. But GB had slumped to a low level. Uh, Pete Russell took over his first game in charge. With five seconds to go, they're trading 1-0. Mark Richardson pops up to make it 1-1 with five seconds to go with the netminder pulled, maybe on a power play as well, can't remember. And then 11 seconds into overtime, Mark Richardson scores and GB win by two goals to win. Five seconds to go, Pete Russell's era is starting with a, you know, not disappointing, but sadly a 1-0 loss to Croatia. And then 11 seconds into overtime, Pete Russell's won his first game. And, and Pete Russell said he wanted GB in his tenure to play with passion and energy. That's what Pete Russell's all about. And there was evidence of that in his very first game. Look, you know, th there was some real tough times along the way and some last day disappointments and silver medals that were heartbreaking. You know, I've never seen tears amongst a group of players you know not once but twice GB needed a point to go up to the second tier and they had to settle for a silver medal that that must have been really hard to 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 lift the team but the thing that happened there was home ice and, and Belfast and what a massive moment and again you talk about games well that as a sort of exhibition to, to be part of uh, organising committee and to be part of a media team for a tournament on home ice was fantastic and, and right from that first game for GB they won all five they demolished Japan 4-0 no such worries in the final game and then they went to the second tier which brings me on to my my kind of best ever some might think the top tier against France because they've come from behind and the elite tier they've played Canada they've played USA and by the way they were pinch me moments when you know GB were taken to the ice against yeah, Canada for sure, for and sure. against USA yeah. but yeah but but the France game yes that was remarkable and I think the GB players if you asked all of them they'd probably say the France game and I get that because a team that was ranked 8-9 or whatever places above them they were down and out 3-0 down but they managed to win 4-3 but for me, the hungry game w w won't be beaten because GB went as bottom seed again in that tournament, don't forget. And momentum built in only the way Pete Russell can build momentum in a team. The Dare to Dream slogan was born. And again, home ice for hungry. GB 2-0 down. Dow gets that goal. 
then you think it's all over because Hungary have a penalty shot. That place, those fans, I mean, the GB fans are amazing when they go away, but they were being drowned out because there was 15,000 Hungary fans. That place is bouncing. Hungary have a penalty shot to win it. They don't score it. Bounds amazing, makes a save. And then, and then GB score with 15 seconds to go. And that place just goes quiet as a, as you can hear a pin drop, apart from, because I was on the opposite side, the commentators, Murph and Paul Ady and Andy French with Seth Bennett on the BBC, they were next to the GB fans on the far side, but I was in the press box on the other side. And, and yeah, but to me, that will be the most special one until we beat Canada to win the gold medal, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, one you day, know, one day. That will, be the mo- <laughs> that will be the most special one because... You know, when that full-time hooter went, it was a realisation that, that GB were going to the top flight and what they were going to do. You know, a couple of years earlier, you know, they, they had lost to Croatia 4-0. And for me to be part of that journey with, with such a great team, not just the coaches and the players and the off-ice staff, but the media team, we all experienced it together. Um, and, and, and with the Belfast one, when GB went up, I remember thinking because we were the host nation, you you can imagine the jobs are a manic. So it wasn't just getting the media out and the stuff out to the, to the UK media and doing that role. It was looking after the media that had come from all around the world and and looking after running the event. And I was lucky to have a great team, you know, involved with, with myself there as always people like, you know, Craig Simpson, um, Dave Burnham. Uh, Dean Woolley, you know, uh, just, uh, just, you know, some of the people who have been with us on the journey. I mentioned Seth and the guys on the TV, but the behind the scenes people there. Um, but, but I'm kind of rambling on to my point. But, you know, after the Belfast one, I just felt that I didn't kind of soak it in. So that hungry one, you know, to, to be privileged to be on the bench at the end of the game, to go on the ice and do the interviews for Five Live that doubled up for Ice Hockey UK TV, you know, I, I soak that one all in and, and, and you say just just to kind of look at the guys and see the journey that they'd been on and, and that they were now going to play Canada and, and USA was was remarkable. And, and, and that hungry game will stand out to me forever. I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, Aaron Murphy's call on the Robert Farmer goal is just <laughs> absolutely incredible. Every time I, I listen to it, I get goosebumps. Uh, somebody always circulates it on Twitter, like in, in the however many year anniversary, every single year afterwards. And like the voice crack that happens to Aaron Murphy, because you could tell he is so excited as well that yeah. Great Britain have managed to tie up. It's such, such a fantastic call. And I, I would agree with you there, I think, Chris, in the sense that yeah, like staying up against France, is a, it was a monumental win for great British hockey and the fact that we're going to be back there again. Obviously, we were supposed to be there for this year's tournament. Obviously, it didn't happen. So, I mean, in, in, our, in our kind of a positive note for us, we get to be there next year. So it's not the, the worst thing in the world for us. But also the fact that, like you mentioned, the, the GB national team had suffered so many close yet not close enough defeats, the final day heartbreaks, but like, look at them now, you know, like just a couple of years later, they managed to defy all expectations. I, I, I think you mentioned uh, like the, the impact that Pete Russell had on that team GB team on continues to have. I, I don't think that can be understated. I, I, oh, as, as a fan kind no. of seeing the impact that he has had on that team and kind of, he's managed to get all the, t- all the players to buy into that philosophy. They, they, trust the coach to know what he's doing and it's just paid dividends for the for the international program of the men's team isn't it oh oh i could talk for hours about pete russell in fact i've just written an article about him for for jeff Woolhouse's new ice hockey magazine which i'm sure you may well have seen that uh, mm. uh, just uh we've had his first issue pete russell i mean i'm, I'm going to start on pete and then i'm going to go on to a few other people but but pete russell is is the reason behind GB's success. Obviously the players, the off-ice staff, the other coaches, uh, but, but Pete Russell's role cannot be underestimated. You know, he's the most successful junior coach for Great Britain. He's now the most successful coach ever for Great Britain. And I, I came across Pete first with my GB junior hat on, uh, and I got to know him. And I got to know him really well at a tournament in Dumfries when Brees, when, when, when it was that went out. Um, and I forget which channel it eventually aired on, um, but it was a behind-the-scenes um, documentary put together by a production company that, that had uh, that, that I've mentioned people's names before. And it was a fascinating watch. And if you did see it, or if you ever get a chance to somehow see it again, that gives you an insight into Pete Russell. 
uh, his passion. You know, he, he, he was talking to his assistant coaches, Paul Heavey, I think, and, and Tommy Watkins, who were the under 20s assistants at the time. And, and, you know, and, and they might, they, they might them up. They might Pete Russell up for the whole of the tournament. It was, it was, uh, you know, I remember because I've got my Ice Hockey UK hat on. I remember the conversations. Can we do this? Uh, Ice Hockey UK were worried. Pete Russell was a bit worried, you know, because you can imagine what the sort of, you know, language might be like on a bench. But, <laughs> but Pete came across so well. And, and one thing I remember him saying, like, you know, you know, I, I want this this game to win it so much. Can't remember if it was a game against France or, or Italy. There was there was a famous game. GB won on penalty shots and I'm I'm just confused now between Italy and France because one of them GB were winning and then took a late penalty and ended up losing and the other one uh, they won on penalty shots uh, I, I can't remember Italy or France forgive me it's been a, been a few years but Pete says if we win I think I might cry at the national anthem and that shows you the passion that, that he has and and that's just continued on and, and the phone call at Christmas that Andy French and then Ice Hockey UK chairman Jim Anderson made to Pete Russell, because it raised some eyebrows at the time. More than one high-profile sort of figure, commentator, analyzer, were like, Pete Russell, really? But they didn't know Pete Russell. They didn't know him like those people that made the decision. And they didn't know him like players knew him. And there were, there were, I am sure there won't have been one complaint about Pete Russell when he was appointed. And I will go back slightly, because before Pete Russell was appointed head coach, he had a season as assistant coach under... Doug Christensen and the other assistant was Corey Nielsen, who of course is still um, assistant coach now. And Pete obviously gave a team talk before one of the games. I wasn't present for it. It's very rare we get, you know, the honour of being in the dressing room. The, the, the couple of times where that door shut and the media team happens to be there, it's been an honour. And, and one of those times was was after that win over France, which, you know, as you can imagine, was a very uh, humbling experience. But no, we mic'd up Davy Phillips for a feature on Ice Hockey UK TV in that tournament in Lithuania, where GB, I think, finished fourth under Doug Christensen, missed out on a bronze medal. Poland, I think, got the gold and went up that year. But my point there on this one, we might Dave Phillips up and they were doing a drill and they just stopped and he turned to Pete Russell and Davy Phillips said, can you come in and give a team talk again tomorrow because I'll throw my head in front of the puck for you. And, and, and again, there's the early indication of what Pete Russell can do. You know, it's not just the talent he has of a coach, which is immense because you know he wouldn't be succeeding in del2 now as he is and he wouldn't have taken gb from third tier to the top tier on passion alone that that boy knows what he's doing you know but his passion the way he gets players to buy into what he does and, and that trio now of Corey nielsen alongside him and, and adam keith are just perfect they both have different things that you can love about them and, and then led by people like and i'll go on to other people if you don't mind andy buxton the general manager again mm -hmm. be, from a different angle where gb would be without him i don't know he is the glue you know gb players you know just need to just need to go for a week you know, that's all they need to know when to do because everything else on a trip is planned for them. They just got this, when to go for a wee and when to go for a walk. Um, you know, and, and it's remarkable. And with Andy French as well, the general secretary, the two of them work so well together. And then the off ice team, you know, because, you know, I know I'm going on a bit here, but hockey isn't just about the coaches and the players that we, we sing the accolades to. The, the, the off ice team, is so close knit uh, and you know they go above and beyond you know the physios will say you know it's it's nine o'clock at night they'll go like right you know our doors are open if you need physio you know you know they may have been to training they may have had physio during the day you know and 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 the equipment managers and and everything you know and and dr matt robbins i mean I, you know i name the team now because they deserve you you've got matt robbins the the gb doctor who, who's at the heart of everything you know that, that gb do from a medical point of view mari and nikki you know on on the side of the physios and the sports therapists and then um you know taffy uh you know what a what a great guy taffy is and what a, what what a great guy he is and steve small as well you know that the off ice team there absolutely fantastic so i started on pete russell and that point still stands but what you got to remember you know about great britain it's it's the unity from everyone involved and it's 
you know, as you can tell, it's something that I'm honored to be a part of and to watch those cogs work because that's why GB have got where they are, led by Pete Russell with all those other things. Yeah, he's, uh, he's such a such a great coach. I mean, so you mentioned there um, about like the emotion that the 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 players all have in saying crying at the national anthem. It's quite a strange position, kind of. I found myself in even earlier. So you must have done as well. In that, you can have players. So you speak to them at the high points of their career when they've just you know got up to the. But also you speak to them. And like we've had it before, we've been waiting like 10, 15 minutes for Tim Wallace to come out after a loss and you know that he's in there giving the players everything. And then you've got, you're also obviously trying to speak to players when they're at their lowest, when they've just missed out on the gold medal. Again, it seemed like we went through a a patch of, they won the silver about five years in a row. We used to always get to the gold medal game and Mm. you kind of always used to know that it wasn't quite going to happen. How do you kind of balance the, kind of, because you've got players they might just really not want to talk to you. They might just want the ground to, to swallow them up whole. Mm-hmm. And yet you've got to go in there with a microphone in their face and go, come on, then tell me about that. that that's, that's a great question, Chris. Uh, and, you know, domestically with, with Panthers and other teams, when I've worked on, you know, on domestic games, you know, big games on, on television and with GB. But the, the one thing I will say about the Great Britain boys is they are brilliant. They will never say no to an interview, whether they've, you know, whether they've won or lost. Uh, and that's great credit to them. And, and some of those interviews, you know, you've got to be professional, you know, because, you know, I, I, first and foremost, I'm a, a, a Great Britain supporter. It's an honor to, to be there. I'm riding those emotions. So when you've got to not, I mean, I'm going to say not be tight, but you've probably, but you've probably seen, you've probably seen on, probably seen on some that's hard not to but in the lows as well you you know you do feel like welling up and the, and, and the, being honest with you there have been you know I, I did interviews after those silver medals uh you know last day defeats where you know I'm asking questions and there's tears in my eye you probably wouldn't have seen it you may not have noticed in my voice but you know you, you've got to somehow compose it together um, and, and ask those tough questions. Why didn't it work? What went wrong? And as I say, that second time, I remember walking on the bench after it happened those two years. It, I mean, it was only two years in a row. I understand, Chris, it feels like more, but it was two in a <laughs> row feel where like they had that last day disappointment. <laughs> but, 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 you know, I mean, I, I could, I, the first person I spoke to was, was Tommy Watkins. And he was crestfallen. And he got some words out. Then I went to Pete Russell and, and, and Pete maybe struggled a bit more. And I think a couple of times he just went, uh, I don't know what to say, Chris. And, you know, what, you know, what, you know, what can you do? But you have to hold that professionalism together, you know, mm-hmm. because some fans will be demanding. I mean, I th- I'm sure the majority of GB fans would have realized for what it was. I think, I think GB got unlucky two years in a row. I th- actually think the first year they got the uh, silver medal when they should have beaten Lithuania uh, was probably more of a game they should have won than the second year when they, when they fell to Ukraine. Um, but, and, and that's what I think hurt the most for GB player be, be, because they, they just know that they had those chances. But it, it's a good question. You have to keep your composure. But again, on the other side, you may not have seen the interview with Matthew Myers, but I was lucky to say after that hungry game, after sending send on the tweet that said GB had got promoted, I ran down from the press box to go ice level for overtime and what turned out penalties. And I think it was at the end of overtime where Seth crossed to me live on Five Live and the first person I spoke to was Andy Buxton and then Matthew Myers. And Matthew Myers just started sobbing. And, and that showed how much it, it meant to him. So, you know, I've seen tears in, in defeats and, and, and in victory. And you've just got to hold it together. Sometimes it's really hard, but that's what you've got to do. Absolutely. And I think uh, GB hockey fans are very much riding those emotions, like you mentioned, with the players. Obviously, well, they're, they're not the ones winning those gold medals, but given how much they know how much the national team has toiled through those lower divisions, how the the heartbreaking losses that we've mentioned and how invested they are in those boys as well. Because I think somewhat different to those bigger hockey nations out there, the ones that GB are going up against in the world championships nowadays, 
because it, the the hockey community in in the UK and in GB is a lot more tight knit, and the fans feel a little bit more. I, I would say they feel a little bit more connected to the players than say the Sidney Crosbys and the Alexander Ovechkins mm-hmm. from their native country. So, so it's kind of like we feel those emotions with them as well, because it's such a big deal for us. Whereas you know the big mm-hmm. hockey nations, they're used to being up in the main competition. If they win a gold medal, it's a great thing. But like they've done it before, they do it semi regularly. But for for Team Great Britain to to be able to win several gold medals on the trot and be able to make it up to the big competition to take on the big boys and actually manage to stay there for a year, it, it just goes to show how much it means to kind of the hardcore GB fans and even some of the casual fans as well, the fact that they're so invested in it as well. But but speaking of of, of Team GB, do you see this uh the system that's in place with pete russell and um and and keith and nielsen do you see the roster is pretty set i would say for the next few years or so given the the players on the roster and given the ages of some of the guys there's still plenty of guys with plenty of hockey left to play do you think there's going to be do you think we're going to see a continuation do you think we're going to see more success to come do you think we'll have better performances in the world championships over the next few years. I know that's a difficult task given some of the nations that they're going up against, especially in, in hopefully next year's tournament, if it goes ahead, but, but do you, do you see it? Where, where do you see the, the men's national team going in the next couple of years? Yeah, very interesting question. I mean, there's a lot of good players who, who are close to retirement. I mean, Jonathan Phillips, Matthew Myers, uh, you know, it, the two of them would have got 100 caps if they'd have played in, in this tournament that got cancelled. You know, let's hope they're both around to get 100 caps if we play in, in 2021 or, or, or whenever. I mean, both of them are very fit guys. Uh, so so hopefully, but, but you know, they're close, aren't they? Jonathan Phillips and Matthew Myers, two best friends, ironically. Uh, in fact, they were on the same amount of caps and they would have hit 100 caps together, which would have been brilliant until Matthew Myers took a knock in Slovakia and missed one or two games. So they won't quite hit it at the same time, but they should still hit it at the same tournament. Um, But yeah, no, GB will change. There will be a changing of the guard in the the coming years. Players like the two of them that I mentioned will, will go. Uh, Jonathan Phillips, boy, will they miss him. What a player, what a captain he has been. Uh, I'm not going to say irreplaceable because that's disrespectful for who becomes the next captain. But just like I've paid the, 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 the sort of tributes to Pete Russell as coach, same goes for Jonathan Phillips. You know, he sets the example on the ice that, that his other players follow. Uh, and again, no success that he's been the, cap- the, the captain as GB has have gone from success to success. I, I think there's a real transition point in, in, in GB's history coming up. And, and some of these top players will end up retiring. And it goes back to my thing, doesn't it? We need to get our British players yep. playing at the, the best possible level. Uh, Mason uh, Alderson, what a great talent he is. Uh, he's ripped it up when playing for the under-20s and under-18s. I want to see an elite league club take a punt on him soon uh, and get him ice time. You know, would Pete Russell maybe think about taking him to a world championship? I don't know, but he's just one of a, a number of players that are, are, are really talented in that programme. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of responsibility on people like Mark Richardson, although he's, you know, not, not, not retiring Mark Richardson yet, but, but he's a bit older. Robert Dowd, Robert Farmer, um, that they're players that will, that will that will kind of they're responsible players now, but they'll take on extra responsibility. But yeah, we, the, there will be a changing of the guard, and you, you could you know the, my hope is that th- those players that are that are already in the roster but don't have the experience of the likes of, of, of oh, I hate saying the likes of, it's one of my pet hates, uh, the people like uh, Matthew Myers or, or Jonathan Phillips, you know, the, the players who are kind of in their early 30s to late 20s, the benefits they will gain from being at the top level will help them in seasons to come. And, and then maybe here or there, Pete Russell can blood some of these exciting young players. Yeah, I think there's definitely, you know, young players coming through. I mean, obviously Liam Kirk is still really young. Um, I think one of the things that I really liked about to Tim Wallace in the last year was that he gave four fly nice time to to Kelsall and and like that. So there are obviously young players that are that are coming through. But Chris, um 
what's the favourite? We've got listeners from all around Europe and we have people from Poland, Bulgaria, all the rest of it. What's the, was it the best arena that you've been to? Because you've been, you've been to a lot following, uh, following various teams around. I've, I've got to probably say um, the Pap Laszlo Arena in, in Hungary. I've been twice. Ironically, that my first um, world championship, so I went to the um, Olympic qualifiers in Latvia, whatever, 2000 and whatever. But my first world championship covering GB in the Pap Laszlo Arena, um, GB got relegated, didn't win a game, and, and went down to the third tier when they kind of quietly behind closed doors thought we might have a chance of, of going up. We've had great preparation in the final Olympic qualifiers in Latvia. That was a great arena as well. Um, but no, GB went down. So how kind of the... the how sort of fitting was it that GB then went back up to the top flight in that same arena? But yeah, that, that arena, it's, it's got very steep seats. The noise is, is something to behold. So yeah, I've been very lucky to see some, some great arenas in uh, Latvia. Kazakhstan, the one in Kazakhstan was ridiculously amazing, but it, but it was unfortunately not full. Um, uh, Korea. The Olympic venue for the, the Korea tournaments, though I was very lucky to, to go for those tournaments for GB women. Kazakhstan for the Olympic qualifiers, uh, GB women and GB under 18s played in those two Olympic venues. But I mean, again, I, I don't want to digress too much, but I was so privileged to go to those Olympic venues in Korea because it just so happened that GB women and GB under 18s were in the same group as Korea women and Korea under 18s. And normally all the venues get voted on by the teams in the division and by the IIHF board. But on this occasion, Korea said, look, we're hosting the Olympics in X amount of months' time. Can we host these two together to give us a trial run? Mm. IIH said yes. And, and myself and um, Dean Woolley um, got the chance to... No, Dean Woolley came to Kazakhstan. It was Carl Denham, uh, another great guy. Oh, yeah, who yeah. Works for, for, you, know, you know Carl. Uh, Carl Denham and I had the, the, the amazing experience of going to, to Korea. Uh, that was a two fabulous venues. The venue in Kazakhstan was great, but if I think for 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 one, it would be Hungary because the Pab Laszlo Arena, which I think I'm right in saying, the ice only gets put down for the tournament. It's normally just a, a sort of um, entertainment venue, but the atmosphere and the noise is amazing. So so yeah, my my favourite GB game probably comes in my favourite G- favourite venue to visit. <laughs> And why not with such great memories attached to it? I, I have yeah. a bit of a, a curveball question to ask you. Oh, um, here we go. It, it's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not a crazy one, but uh, like Chris mentioned, we're a, uh, we're a podcast that's listened to across Europe. So we obviously deal with a lot of the European leagues that are up and running at the moment, such as the Swedish Hockey League, the Swiss National League, the Continental Hockey League, more out in Eastern Europe. But regarding the Continental Hockey League, I don't know if you're aware of this because it's kind of mentioned every single year and the validity of the rumours are questionable at best I think would be fair to say Um, but there's been some rumours pretty much every single year for the past four or five years that the Continental Hockey League primarily based outside of Russia but they have a team in Finland, Latvia uh, uh, China which is playing in Russia this year because of the pandemic Um, there's been some rumours that they're interested in putting a team in London and having a London team involved in the KHL What, what would your kind of response be if you heard the news that you know, the KHL, a team, uh, a league that's predominantly um, filled with Russian players. There's a bit of disparity between the the top and bottom teams, but um, with the hard salary cap coming in this year, it's gotten slightly better, as Chris and I have talked about over the over the last few weeks. If you heard that news, what would your response be? And how do you think that would go as like a, a UK hmm. hockey team? Do you think it would be a successful venture? Do you think it would struggle a bit i'm really curious to get your thoughts because you're much keyed up into the the uk hockey scene than we are so go for it <laughs> yeah i mean i mean those i mean those discussions have taken place mm. um do i think it will ever happen probably not mm. but but you know the khl is you know is 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 keen to get a team in the uk i mean you know let's not forget you know KHL teams have played in the UK and how how great a success was that when the mm. games took place especially the one in in Coventry absolutely fantastic um it, it is a bit of a curveball because I, I come at it from two angles 
I think it would be fantastic in some senses because I think it would grow the profile of the game in the UK. And, I, you know, it'd be London-based, obviously. Yeah. Um, I, I think the eyes of the world would turn to ice hockey in the UK, but it'd be the KHL. It wouldn't be the Elite League. Now, would that in turn have some sort of spin-off for the Elite League and for GB? I mean, to be honest, GB ice hockey... Um, are at the top of their game anyway. You know, you only had to see the reaction they got from the media from all around the world. No one doesn't know about, you know, people who thought that GB was a hockey backwalker, backwater no longer think that because of GB's achievements. But it's a really interesting point about the KHL. And while it would raise, raise the profile, I, I don't know how good it would be for the elite league. And I also fear that, you know, would some of the best elite league players be, you know, like, Ben Bounds, I know he's already gone and he may never come back to the Elite League. And again, double-edged sword, I, I really want Ben Bounds to be in the Elite League because I want the best British players playing in the Elite League. But I also want to see the best for British players. Mm. And if that's playing in some of the best leagues in Europe, then I'm sorry that wins for me. So why mm. it's sad that Ben Bound goes, we'll just have to create another netminder as good as, as Ben Bounds. Um, but yeah, so, so my thought is if the KHL comes to town, you know, maybe some, some GB players would, would end up getting jobs there. I don't think it will happen. And again, now, because of the pandemic, the whole landscape of not just UK hockey might change. But I, I see the appetite. I understand the appetite. I understand why the Elite League would be resistant to it. But, but you know, I also see the attractions from many areas because sponsorship would, would be massive, you know, and, and maybe some clever marketing person that the Elite League Club would, would bounce off that and get something. But it, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting question, that one. Uh, and it, it's it, the KHL in the UK, the rumour is quieter than it's ever been. Yeah. You know, mm. if, you, if you'd asked me about two or three years ago, I would have said there's more than a 50% chance. That was the feeling I was getting. Yeah. If you ask me now, it's it's probably less than fifty percent, and 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 you know the landscape's changing. Um, but it's a fascinating question, and 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 maybe one day it will it will, it will happen. But it perhaps feels less likely than it did perhaps a few years ago. And look, I have no official information. You know, I get to luckily to talk to people and see conversations happen and and stuff like that. But but yeah, you know, it, it it's I think it's it's no secret that it's potential and it's not just tittle tattle but uh, but i do feel we're perhaps less closer to now it, it was than we were a while back i oh, was wondering with it if people would would travel because in nottingham sheffield mm. area it's a good three hours down into london by by car to go and see that team um but uh chris it's uh I'm a bit conscious of the time. I've got one final question for you, which isn't as much of a curveball as, as, <laughs> as Hayden's. Um, and we've been, I know I, I contacted you a few weeks ago with the, whether that penalty shot was a goal or not. Oh, and yeah. we, we, tried to, we tried to speak to some referees as well. Tom Darnell hasn't yet got back to us after he's retired. <laughs> but um, what, if you were kind of, you know, head of the, the double IHF, what one rule would you change in ice hockey? Oh, Oh, that's a great question. I thought Tom had replied. Didn't he say goal? I'm sure he replied. I sent him, I sent him a did. message. I don't... Well... Did, did I, I never tell you, you his reply? I don't think you ever told me the reply, but I... Oh, here I we was. go. There's some beef starting on the podcast, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, now, I can't, now, now I can't remember. Now I can't remember. I... I think he said... I think, it's, I think he said it's a goal to me, but I don't want to misquote him. <laughs> but, but there you go. You'd have, to get, you'd have to get him on the podcast. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll try and set That's it what up I mean. to we've, get you on, we've contact, get him on the podcast. We've contacted him to be a guest, but he hasn't responded to us yet. Well, he, he's, a, he's a very busy man. Leave it oh, with I me, because he, yeah. he, he would be a very, very good listen, For um, sure. yeah. Tom Darnell. Someone you spend, if you spend, you know, any time I've spent more than five or ten minutes in his company, it's great. And I was very lucky to be covering the free sports game, his last game in charge. And mm. I was lucky to, to do his last interview as well. And then spent a bit of time with him and his friends after the game uh, and deservedly got a, a great send off, you know, because he, he's been one of our top referees for, for a long time. Um, what rule would I change? Oh, I wish you'd given me a bit of notice. Um, <laughs> BBC, a rule that tell I, you questions in advance, Chris. You know this. Yeah, a rule, a, a rule, a rule that I would change. Um, 
I know Jono doesn't like the instigator rule. That's the one he'd get rid of. Yes, I, I, I don't like, I don't like the instigator rule. Um, I, I understand that. The, the problem is, I feel there's something that really grinds my gears. Mm. But because I haven't watched hockey for so long, yeah, <laughs> um, I, I've, I've forgotten what that was. The, the instigator rule is a good one. Um, I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see longer overtime in the elite league. I understand why. Um, but, I, you know, I mean, even the, the NHL, you know, in their regular season, I mean, I'm just so glad now that like in the grand final in the playoffs, the Elite League a few mm. years ago, reverted to 20 to minute overtime periods, yeah. four on four. Uh, the, the one about Jono um, uh, instigator is fine because there's one referee once put to, to me and I can't remember which, what, which referee it was. Is is it's how you assess the instigator rule because you know mm. you you could say the instigator rule is is a guy chasing a guy around a rink to fight, but if if the guy that's being chased has just clamoured your star player into the boards, surely it's that guy who's it. And one ref said to me that's why he would sometimes kind of overlook the instigator rule because if a guy clamours your 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 star player into the boards, that's that, that instigates the situation. So, so that, that, that's a very, and, and I like that because yeah, that does, you know, not the guy going to fight, the guy going to fight is sticking up for his teammate. So, so mm. Jono's right. I think the instigator is one, um, you know, I, that kind of answered my own question with the, um, with, with the penalty shots and, you know, with the, with the, uh, you know, longer overtime. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm kind of going to have to go to, 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 to sort of, to, to, to the, um, instigator rule i think i think that's one that would be high up my list because um i can't think of any more and if i think of anything before we wrap up i'll interrupt you but um <laughs> you know you know that you know I, th- I think the sports i think the sports you know getting there in in, in terms mm. of you know how it how it sells itself that there's that there's still that you know uneven balance between fighting some people love it some people hate it some clubs sell fighting to attract fans in, others feel a bit awkward about selling, uh, selling fighting to get fans in. It's it's a real sort of borderline, especially working for the BBC. And you know, mm. you you know that, Chris. I mean, again, it's anyone who watches ice hockey knows it's part of the game. But you know, there's a lot of people who say that's a bit unsavoury. If it happened in a football game, what we see on an ice hockey pitch, there'd be long, long, long bands. And I'm not just talking yeah, about some would, of the more yeah. unsavory stuff we've seen in ice hockey. I'm talking about a you know a, 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 a run of the mill five minutes for fighting. That's going to be three games minimum in football, if not more. Oh, easy, um, yeah, easy. So you know, um, but it, but football's not ice hockey. It's a different sport. It's very different. So you can't compare the two. Um, so yeah, so I you know ice hockey does have that uneasy balance. You know, it, it takes us to a different subject. You know, if we're talking in ten years' time, we're fighting still be part of the sport i don't think so to the way we see it today um but, yeah. but that's a fascinating question and i and i know i've sort of fluffed the answer <laughs> around but um but yeah if, if i if i do think of something uh, i'll let you know <laughs> it is really it's kind of really bad but part of me does want to see a bench clearance at some point in my life <laughs> <laughs> Well, they're remarkable. And I mean, I've seen the, what I saw the one in, in, in Nottingham and we were right close to it because in those days, Radio Nottingham's commentary point, you'll laugh at this, Chris, it was actually in the stands. But in, the, in the old arena, it was in the stands. And for whatever reason, that transferred into the new arena. And it was just very close to the Panthers bench, probably five rows up from the front. Um, so yeah. you were just sitting, sitting with the fans. It was only two or three years, maybe after the arena opened, that eventually we went up into the high, into the gods. Um, so we were right in the action then. Uh, and yeah, look, that was a m- remarkable. And the adrenaline to see that was remarkable. But was it, was it great for the sport? Probably not. There goes your cat, I think. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's there, there's my there's my cat Mowgli for any of the uh, YouTube watchers. <laughs> she she she's probably had enough of me talking. That was her sign to say shut up. But but no. Um. But yeah. But was it great for the sport? Probably not. It got some bad headlines. Did it attract people to the sport? Yes, it probably did. 
uh, and yeah. it, it got people coming back for more. But, you know, because, again, I remember seeing a friend at that game who I hadn't seen for years from school. And he said, oh, I've never been to ice hockey before. <laughs> Not even Sheffield, bench clearance sport. If it's like this every week, I'm coming again. <laughs> you know, so it depends on what your taste is about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you'll get unlucky, Chris. I don't think you'll see a bench clearance brawl now no. while watching. Elite, you know, you might have to go to North America in those fighting leagues. But, you know, I, I think in the elite league, the last one I remember was that, that one in Coventry where uh, Cruikshank rang uh, the goalie, rang Kowalski in the Nottingham game. Uh, and, and, and a bit of hell broke loose. Nothing compared really to the Sheffield one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think you'll see another one again, to be no, honest. No, I think it would take... Something like that. I remember seeing, I've watched the YouTube video of that countless times. It seems going, cameraman, pan right, pan right. That's the one. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah. And, and, and in, as much as that's exciting and as much as the kind of, I wouldn't say pantomime, but as much as the drama was, was, was thrilling, it's not ice hockey to me, you know. Mm. Uh, that, that wasn't ice hockey. Uh, and, and yes, it's something that I'll talk about. And, you know, and new players come. You know, I remember Matthew Tusignon, when he came to do an interview with me on, on Facebook Live, I said to him, do you know about this? And he, he kind of heard about it. And then afterwards, I sent him the link. I said, go on, watch this. And he, you know, and he replied, said, wow, that's unbelievable. So, you know, it, mm. it shows that people still talk about it, which in itself generates publicity. Um, but but I, the game's moved on a bit, I think, since then. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, well, the, the, the game has developed a lot, <laughs> hasn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, Chris, it's been absolutely fabulous having you on for the past what, hour and a half here on the, the Euro It's been great. Podcast. I've loved it. Thank You've you. You've told us some fascinating stories, mm. um, a great insight to behind the scenes and uh, yes, I'm sure all our um, viewers and listeners around uh, Europe and North America will, will love hearing your stories. And hopefully um, we'll get back into the arena soon. I'll be able to join you back in, in the BBC office. And uh, Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm missing our trips, hopefully, hopefully. And thanks, and guys, really appreciate you having me on because it's been great to recount these memories. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it, Chris. Thank you very much. So yeah, that was our interview with Chris Ellis and obviously talking a lot about GB Hockey, talking about his career through uh, the, the the hockey scene and kind of where he's got today. Uh, Chris, it was very good of you to, to invite him onto the show. I mean, it, it was obviously you very much took, a, took the lead in that and he was a fantastic guest, wasn't he? Yeah, I, I knew he was going to be a, a really good guest. Hope you guys uh, really all enjoyed it for the well, about hour and a half that that interview was. And uh, yeah, we've got uh, plenty more coming up on on the Euro Puck podcast. Was, uh, I think next week we're planning on kind of bring you back up to date with all of the leagues. Uh, make sure you follow us on Twitter because uh, we've started a new game as well. Um, this this week is the, is the first week, but you can all join next week. We're kind of doing a, a predictions game. Um, so every week we'll be putting ten fixtures out on our uh, Twitter page. We want you to predict. Uh, the results and we'll keep a rolling tally and uh, the winner of each week we'll give them a nice shout out on the podcast um so make sure you you follow us on on twitter if you don't already and, and take part in our uh, our predictions game but yes a big thank you to uh, chris for uh, coming on the uh, the podcast this week um, and said he had some great stories hope you all found it interesting and uh, yeah you can follow uh, Either of us on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Chris underscore Gadsby there, and uh, Hayden is uh, at Oddman Rush YT about there. I right think. there, <laughs> um, and uh, and of course at Europuck Podcast and the rest of the Hockey Podcast Network. I love it when you do my job for me, Chris. But yeah, on that note, we'll see you again <laughs> next time. Have a good one, folks. <laughs>